What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping? Who angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch our keeping? Hello and welcome to day four of the Crufflet Christmas Extravaganza. If you are new to this audio, please know that there are three previous days worth of audio for you waiting at craftlit.com and also at Craftlit's channel on YouTube, which is new. Today we have some fun and some heartwarmingness for you. We will begin and end with two different stories from L. Frank Baum. I don't know if you know that he wrote an entire book of Christmas stories, uh, which I have linked to from the show notes at craftlit.com and also the notes underneath the screen on the YouTube page. It's much longer, and so if you want to go listen to that, you'll have to do that on your own time. But he wrote a, a bunch of Christmas stuff, and we have two small samples from him today. One is called The Christmas Stocking, and that's the introduction to a section, and one is called A Kidnapped Santa Claus. Then we also have a story from J.T. Stocking, who I imagine you don't know. J.T. Stocking lived from 1870 until 1936. He was a congregational clergyman, and he worked at the Lawrenceville School in New Jersey. As a clergyman, often, if he was going to write, he wrote rather religious stories, and that is the one, or one of the ones, that we will be listening to today. We're going to listen to one called The Shepherd Who Didn't Go. And remember, way back in the beginning on day one, I said some of the poems, some of the stories, they're going to be a little more didactic, a little more teachy, and this is one of those. Still a nice, family-friendly, heartwarming story, bookended by Frank Baum. And Frank Baum, uh, Lyman Frank Baum, better known as L. Frank Baum. I'm sure you know he lived from 1856 to 1919, and he is the man responsible for bringing us the wonderful Wizard of Oz and all of the fabulous Oz books. However, he is so much more than just the Oz books. I'm quoting off of the website right now. He wrote The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and then 13 sequels, nine other fantasy novels, 55 novels in total, plus there are four lost works, that's in quotation marks, 83 short stories, over 200 poems, and nobody even knows how many scripts he wrote. He seems to me kind of like Walt Disney, that he was constantly pushing, constantly trying to innovate and come up with new stuff and new information. And in fact, he, kind of like H.G. Wells and, and Jules Verne, he predicted a lot of really interesting things. So Baum is not just the Wizard of Oz. There's a lot more to him, and we're just going to get a tiny little taste of that today. All right, that's it. Enjoy the audio. Here we go. The Christmas Stocking by L. Frank Baum An ancient Italian legend tells how good St. Nicholas of Padua first gave presents on Christmas Eve by throwing purses in at the open windows of needy people. Purses in those days were knitted of yarn and tied with strings at the open ends. They were not unlike stockings, except that they had no feet. People began to hang these long, empty purses of yarn on their window sills on Christmas Eve, so that St. Nicholas, as he passed by, could put money into them. When money became scarce, the long purses were filled with presents instead, useful things for the big people and books and toys for the children. In cold countries where windows could not be left opened, folks hung their purses near the fireplace, believing that St. Nicholas would come down the chimney and leave his presents for them. And after the knitted purses went out of fashion, they hung up their stockings, which closely resembled the old-time purses, so that there would be plenty of room for the Christmas presents, and old St. Nicholas, or Santa Claus, who lived on through the ages, would know that he had been expected. That is how the Christmas stocking came to be used, and why it will be used for many generations to come in thousands of homes on each succeeding Christmas Eve. It is a pretty custom, expressing the confidence and trust we feel in that sweet charity 
which bestows loving remembrances upon the rich and poor, the mighty and the lowly, on each succeeding birthday of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it is most fitting that he, who taught the word charity, should be honored upon his birth night by a humble imitation of the kindly and generous creed he gave us, peace on earth, good will to all, leads us to recognize the truth of the noble text, it is better to give than to receive. And so, as it teaches us kindliness, good will, and charity, may the Christmas stocking endure forever. Fireside Christmas Short Stories The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J.T. Stocking You have all heard of the shepherds who went to Bethlehem, but I do not believe any of you have heard of the shepherd who didn't go. The Bible does not say anything about him, but his story has come to me and I am going to tell it to you. The city of Bethlehem stood on a hill. Below the town, with its steep, narrow streets and white walls, were gray olive orchards. Below the orchards were gardens bright with flowers. Below the gardens lay green meadows, and beyond these pasture lands that stretched away to the wilderness plains where little patches of grass grew among the bushes and between the great rocks. There were caves among these rocks where wolves used to skulk and sometimes robbers hid. So the shepherds who guarded their flocks in these wild pastures dared not leave them alone. One clear, beautiful night many centuries ago, four shepherds were watching their flocks on these pastures. Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David were their names. Samuel, Ezra, and Joel were strong men, no longer young, with shaggy eyebrows and brown beards. Ezra's was short, Joel's long, and Samuel's streaked with gray. They owned the flocks which they tended. David was a boy with ruddy cheeks, bright eyes, and strong, lithe limbs. He cared for the flocks of old Abraham. Abraham was old and rich and did not work any more, but hired David, whose family was very poor, to care for his sheep. The flocks of the four shepherds were lying quiet on the plains far below the city, and nearby Samuel, Ezra, Joel, and David lay wrapped in their shepherd's cloaks. Samuel, said David, rising upon his elbow. What is it, David? asked the other in a deep voice. Are you not glad that you tend sheep in Bethlehem instead of some distant place? Why, David? asked Samuel sleepily. "'Because it is in Bethlehem that the king we have been looking for so long is to be born. I have been reading it in the prophets only today.' "'Have you only just heard of that?' asked Ezra sourly. "'No,' replied the boy hotly. "'I have heard my mother tell of it ever since I can remember, and I have read it over and over again. Samuel?' "'Yes, David. "'Do you think we shall ever see the promised king?' "'I do not know, my boy,' the older man answered sadly. We have waited long, and there seems little hope for Israel now. But he will come some day. He will come some day. Why do you ask, David? I cannot tell. That is often in my mind. Something makes me think of it tonight. Perhaps it is because I read of him today. Samuel, I would walk to the end of the earth to see the Christ child. Well, you need not start now, grumbled Ezra, and Joel added roughly, Go to sleep, boy, the hour is late. It was much later before David fell asleep, for his head was full of dreams and the stories of wonderful days to come that his mother had told him. But at length he joined the rest in healthy slumber. Suddenly it seemed to each of them that something had passed over him and touched him lightly on the cheek. The older men raised themselves on their elbows, but David sprang to his feet. At first they saw only a great light which nearly blinded them, then they discerned a shining form in the sky and heard a voice say, be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all the people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord, and this is the sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and lying in a manger. And then all the sky was full of light, and the air was full of heavenly voices, singing, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. While the shepherds listened, half joyful, half afraid, the light faded, and the voices floated away. Good will to men, to men, to men. And all was still as before. For a moment the shepherds looked at each other in silent awe and wonder. Then Ezra spoke in a voice dry with fear. What was it? David stood speechless, and Samuel answered reverently. Angels. Brothers, he continued, a wonderful thing has happened to us. It has been a long, long day since angels have spoken to men. Then he girded his shepherd's cloak about him and seized his staff. Come, Ezra, Joel, David, let us be going. Going where? asked Ezra and Joel. Why, to Bethlehem, to see the child. Did not the angel tell us the sign? Let us go at once to find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. There be many mangers in Bethlehem, objected Ezra. I know not how we shall find him, said Joel. 
It is a vain search, I fear. And he drew his cloak about him and reached for his staff. But I will go with you if you say. So they started, Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. But David stood still. Come, David, make haste, called Samuel. But the boy did not move. I cannot go, he said. Cannot go, cried Samuel in amazement. And Ezra added, who said but a little while ago that he would go to the end of the earth to see the king? And so I would, cried David, but the sheep, we cannot leave the sheep alone. The sheep will be safe enough, said Samuel. The dogs will keep them together. There are no wolves tonight. Come, David. But the boy was firm. There is my master. He'll be angry if I leave his flocks alone. Old Abraham will never know, said Joel. Abraham is a hard master, said David. Many a time I have felt his heavy staff on my back. But it is not that which keeps me. I have given my word that, come day, come night, come life, come death, I will not fail to keep the flocks. Go on without me. I must keep my word. Go on. So they went on, impatient and eager for this wondrous quest, Ezra and Joel muttering now and then at the obstinacy of the boy, but Samuel full of glowing admiration. David watched them as they moved up the hill. That dream of finding the Christ child, how could he give it up? Once he started forward, I will go. But something held him back, and he threw himself upon the ground and kept back tears of bitter disappointment. After a time, he grew calmer and found a certain comfort in thinking of the helplessness of his flock. Suddenly, the low growling of his dog brought him to his feet, but he saw nothing, heard nothing, and bade the dog be still. In a moment, with a bark of alarm, the dog was up again and away. David sprang up, certain now that danger was near. There was panic in the flock. Toward the wilderness, he could see lean, gray forms moving stealthily and swiftly among the sheep. Wolves! Springing upon a rock and waving his cloak in circles about his head, he uttered the familiar call which gathered the sheep about him, his own sheep nearest, and behind them the flocks of Samuel, Ezra, and Joel. The wolves made off, and David quickly looked over his flock to see if all were there, for the eastern shepherd knows his sheep by name. One by one he named them, with an increasing feeling of relief. They were all there, no, one was missing. Kebarbara, the pet of the flock. Kebarbara means striped, and the little sheep was so called because of the dark marking of her fleece. After waving his staff over the huddled beasts and uttering a few times the soothing cry, Ooh, da, ooh, da, he rushed off in the direction which the wolves had taken. At the top of the steep bank, at the edge of the pasture, he stopped and called, Kebarbara, Kebarbara, and for an answer, heard an anguished bleat from the rocks below. It was a steep and slippery way, but David plunged down with no thought of anything but the sheep. Loose stones gave way and he lost his footing. At the bottom he picked himself up unhurt, and there beside him were two wolves quarreling over the wounded sheep. One of them slunk away at sight of the boy, but the other had a taste of blood and sprang at David, missing his throat but sinking his teeth into his leg. Then David, as the beast turned to spring again, struck him a heavy blow on the head with his staff and killed him. His own wounds were bleeding and painful, but he turned at once with caressing words to the sheep. Barbara, they have hurt you, little sheep, but they have not killed you. I reached you just in time. You cannot walk, can you? And I am afraid I cannot carry you, but I can help. There, put your head on my arm. He groaned with pain. No, the other one. So he talked to her as to a child, as the wounded boy and the wounded sheep slowly made their way up the steep hillside and over the rough rocks. It was not a long way, and half an hour before the sturdy shepherd lad would have bounded over it quickly enough. But now the wounded leg was slow, the wounded arm was weak, and the wounded lamb seemed very heavy. It was a weary journey, with many stops. When at last they reached the flock, still huddled trembling together, David had only strength to give one reassuring, Ooh, ta, then fell exhausted. How long he lay there he did not know, but the dawn was growing bright when three men appeared from the direction of the town. It was not the shepherds, but old Abraham and two of his servants. As the old man caught sight of his flock, but he saw no shepherd, he raged with anger. David, he shouted fiercely, David! There was no answer. The young vagabond, he has left the sheep. Of great worth are his promises. He would keep my flock. Come life, come death. David, let me once find him and I will give him something he will remember longer than he does his vows. As he drew near the flock, he discovered the boy lying on the ground. Ah, sleep is he, and the sun this high. Come, get up, he shouted fiercely and lifted his staff to strike. But as he did so, he caught sight of the white face and the bleeding arm and noticed the wounded sheep. Old Abraham dropped his angry arm, and there was a touch of tenderness that was strange to him as he continued, "'Ah, David, boy, you did not forget your promises, did you, David? And I would have struck you. Forgive me, my lad.' Then, turning to his servants, he gave them command, "'Take him to the inn and bid them care for him. I myself will keep the flock today.' The servants bowed low. "'The inn is full, my lord.' 
Old Abraham commanded again positively. Take him to the inn, I say. But the inn is full, my lord, replied the older servant, trembling. Then the other servant spoke. There is perhaps room in the stable, my lord. Then bear him thither, and bid them give him the best of care. Go at once. So the servants bore David away, still unconscious from his wounds, and made him comfortable on a bed of straw in the stable of the inn. It was some hours before he came to himself. When at last he opened his eyes and his ears began to catch once more the sounds about him, the first thing he heard was a faint cry. "'What is that?' he asked eagerly of Samuel, who was watching beside him. "'That,' said the old shepherd in tones of mingled joy and reverence, "'is the child the angels told us about, the child we came to see. We found him here in the stable, in a manger.' "'And am I not to see him?' "'Yes, you are,' said Samuel and a grave-faced man brought the child and laid him in David's arms, the child for whose coming the people had been longing for a thousand years. The color at length came back to David's white cheeks and strength and health to his limbs, and he went back again to the plain. Old Abraham embraced him. Forgive me, my son. I have been a hard master. Thou hast been very faithful, and for thy reward I make thee lord over all my flocks, and half of them shall be thine own. So David became a man of flocks and all his days he was known among the other shepherds as the one who had held the Christ child in his arms. And there was none among them who was thought so brave and gentle and wise as the shepherd who didn't go. End of The Shepherd Who Didn't Go by J.T. Stocking Recording by Angela A Kidnapped Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum Santa Claus lives in the Laughing Valley, where stands the big rambling castle in which his toys are manufactured. His workmen, selected from the rills, nooks, pixies, and fairies, live with him, and every one is as busy as can be from one year's end to another. It is called the Laughing Valley because everything there is happy and gay. The brook chuckles to itself as it leaps rollicking between its green banks. The wind whistles merrily in the trees, the sunbeams dance lightly over the soft grass, and the violets and wild flowers look smilingly up from their green nests. To laugh one needs to be happy, to be happy one needs to be content, and throughout the laughing valley of Santa Claus contentment reigns supreme. On one side is the mighty forest of Bursey, at the other side stands the huge mountain that contains the caves of the demons and between them the valley lies smiling and peaceful. One would think that our good old Santa Claus, who devotes his days to making children happy, would have no enemies on all the earth, and, as a matter of fact, for a long period of time, he encountered nothing but love wherever he might go. But the demons who live in the mountain caves grew to hate Santa Claus very much, and all for the simple reason that he made children happy. The caves of the demons are five in number. A broad pathway leads up to the first cave, which is a finely arched cavern at the foot of the mountain, the entrance being beautifully carved and decorated. In it resides the demon of selfishness. Back of this is another cavern, inhabited by the demon of envy. The cave of the demon of hatred is next in order, and through this one passes to the home of the demon of malice situated in a dark and fearful cave in the very heart of the mountain. I do not know what lies beyond this. Some say there are terrible pitfalls leading to death and destruction, and this may well be true. However, from each one of the four caves mentioned, there is a small narrow tunnel leading to the fifth cave, a cozy little room occupied by the demon of repentance. And as the rocky floors of these passages are well worn by the track of passing feet, I judge that many wanderers in the caves of the demons have escaped through the tunnels to the abode of the demon of repentance, who is said to be a pleasant sort of fellow, who gladly opens for one a little door, admitting you into fresh air and sunshine again. Well, these demons of the caves, thinking they had great cause to dislike old Santa Claus, held a meeting one day to discuss the matter. I'm really getting lonesome, said the demon of selfishness, for Santa Claus distributes so many pretty Christmas gifts to all the children that they become happy and generous through his example and keep away from my cave. I'm having the same trouble, rejoined the demon of envy. The little ones seem quite content with Santa Claus, and there are few indeed that I can coax to become envious. 
and that makes it bad for me, declared the demon of hatred, for if no children pass through the caves of selfishness and envy, none can get to my cavern. Or to mine, added the demon of malice. For my part, said the demon of repentance, it is easily seen that if children do not visit your caves, they have no need to visit mine, so that I am quite as neglected as you are. And all because of this person they call Santa Claus, exclaimed the demon of envy. He is simply ruining our business, and something must be done at once. To this they readily agreed, but what to do was another and more difficult matter to settle. They knew that Santa Claus worked all through the year at his castle in the Laughing Valley, preparing the gifts he was to distribute on Christmas Eve, and at first they resolved to try to tempt him into their caves, that they might lead him on to the terrible pitfalls that ended in destruction. So the very next day, while Santa Claus was busily at work surrounded by his little band of assistants, the demon of selfishness came to him and said, These toys are wonderfully bright and pretty. Why do you not keep them for yourself? It's a pity to give them to those noisy boys and fretful girls, who break and destroy them so quickly. Nonsense, cried the old gray beard, his bright eyes twinkling merrily as he turned toward the tempting demon. The boys and girls are never so noisy and fretful after receiving my presents, and if I can make them happy for one day in the year, I am quite content. So the demon went back to the others, who awaited him in their caves, and said, I have failed, for Santa Claus is not at all selfish. The following day the demon of envy visited Santa Claus. Said he, The toy shops are full of playthings quite as pretty as those you are making. What a shame it is that they should interfere with your business. They make toys by machinery much quicker than you can make them by hand, and they sell them for money, while you get nothing at all for your work. But Santa Claus refused to be envious of the toy shops. I can supply the little ones but once a year, on Christmas Eve, he answered, for the children are many, and I am but one. And as my work is one of love and kindness, I would be ashamed to receive money for my little gifts. But throughout all the year the children must be amused in some way, and so the toy shops are able to bring much happiness to my little friends. I like the toy shops, and am glad to see them prosper. In spite of the second rebuff, the demon of hatred thought he would try to influence Santa Claus. So the next day he entered the busy workshop and said, Good morning, Santa. I have bad news for you. Then run away like a good fellow, answered Santa Claus. Bad news is something that should be kept secret and never told. You cannot escape this, however, declared the demon, for in the world are a good many who do not believe in Santa Claus, and these you are bound to hate bitterly, since they have so wronged you. Stuff and rubbish, cried Santa. And there are others who resent your making children happy, and who sneer at you and call you a foolish old rattlepate. You are quite right to hate such base slanderers, and you ought to be revenged upon them for their evil words. But I don't hate em, exclaimed Santa Claus positively. Such people do me no real harm, but merely render themselves and their children unhappy. Poor things! I'd much rather help them any day than injure them. Indeed, the demons could not tempt old Santa Claus in any way. On the contrary, he was shrewd enough to see that their object in visiting him was to make mischief and trouble, and his cheery laughter disconcerted the evil ones, and showed to them the folly of such an undertaking, so they abandoned honeyed words and determined to use force. It was well known that no harm can come to Santa Claus while he is in the Laughing Valley, for the fairies and rills and nooks all protect him, but on Christmas Eve he drives his reindeer out into the big world, carrying a sleigh-load of toys and pretty gifts to the children, and this was the time and the occasion when his enemies had the best chance to injure him. So the demons laid their plans and awaited the arrival of Christmas Eve. The moon shone big and white in the sky, and the snow lay crisp and sparkling on the ground, as Santa Claus cracked his whip and sped away out of the valley, into the great world beyond. The roomy sleigh was packed full with huge sacks of toys, and as the reindeer dashed onward, our jolly old Santa laughed and whistled and sang for very joy. For in all his merry life this was the one day in the year when he was happiest, the day he lovingly bestowed the treasures of his workshop upon the little children. 
It would be a busy night for him, he well knew. As he whistled and shouted and cracked his whip again, he reviewed in mind all the towns and cities and farmhouses where he was expected, and figured that he had just enough presents to go around and make every child happy. The reindeer knew exactly what was expected of them, and dashed along so swiftly that their feet scarcely seemed to touch the snow covered ground. Suddenly a strange thing happened. A rope shot through the moonlight, and a big noose that was in the end of it settled over the arms and bodies of Santa Claus and drew tight. Before he could resist or even cry out, he was jerked from the seat of the sleigh and tumbled head foremost into a snowbank, while the reindeer rushed onward with the load of toys and carried it quickly out of sight and sound. Such a surprising experience confused old Santa for a moment. And when he had collected his senses, he found that the wicked demons had pulled him from the snowdrift and bound him tightly with many coils of the stout rope. And then they carried the kidnapped Santa Claus away to their mountain, where they thrust the prisoner into a secret cave and chained him to the rocky wall so that he could not escape. Ha ha! laughed the demons, rubbing their hands together with cruel glee. What will the children do now? How they will cry and scold and storm when they find there are no toys in their stockings and no gifts on their Christmas trees, and what a lot of punishment they will receive from their parents, and how they will flock to our caves of selfishness and envy and hatred and malice. We have done a mighty clever thing, we demons of the caves. Now it so chanced that on this Christmas Eve the good Santa Claus had taken with him in his sleigh. Nutter the Rill, Peter the Nook, Kilter the Pixie, and a small fairy named Whisk, his four favorite assistants. These little people he had often found very useful in helping him to distribute his gifts to the children, and when their master was so suddenly dragged from the sleigh, they were all snugly tucked underneath the seat, where the sharp wind could not reach them. The tiny immortals knew nothing of the capture of Santa Claus until some time after he had disappeared. But finally they missed his cheery voice, and as their master always sang or whistled on his journeys, the silence warned them that something was wrong. Little Whisk stuck out his head from underneath the seat and found Santa Claus gone and no one to direct the flight of the reindeer. Whoa! he called out, and the deer obediently slackened speed and came to a halt. Peter and Nutter and Kilter all jumped upon the seat and looked back over the track made by the sleigh. But Santa Claus had been left miles and miles behind. What shall we do? asked Whisk anxiously, all the mirth and mischief banished from his wee face by this great calamity. We must go back at once and find our master, said Nutter the Rill, who thought and spoke with much deliberation. No, no, exclaimed Peter the Nook, who cross and crabbed though he was, might always be depended upon in an emergency. If we delay or go back, there will not be time to get the toys to the children before morning, and that would grieve Santa Claus more than anything else. It is certain that some wicked creatures have captured him, added Kilter thoughtfully, and their object must be to make the children unhappy. So our first duty is to get the toys distributed as carefully as if Santa Claus were himself present. Afterward, we can search for our master and easily secure his freedom. This seemed such good and sensible advice that the others at once resolved to adopt it. So Peter the Nook called to the reindeer, and the faithful animals again sprang forward and dashed over hill and valley, through forest and plain, until they came to the houses wherein children lay sleeping and dreaming of the pretty gifts they would find on Christmas morning. The little immortals had set themselves a difficult task, for although they had assisted Santa Claus on many of his journeys, Their master had always directed and guided them, and told them exactly what he wished them to do. But now they had to distribute the toys according to their own judgment, and they did not understand children as well as did old Santa. So it is no wonder they made some laughable errors. Mamie Brown, who wanted a doll, got a drum instead, and a drum is of no use to a girl who loves dolls. And Charlie Smith, who delights to romp and play out of doors, and who wanted some new rubber boots to keep his feet dry, received a sewing box filled with colored worsteds and threads and needles, which made him so provoked that he thoughtlessly called our dear Santa Claus a fraud. Had there been many such mistakes, the demons would have accomplished their evil purpose and made the children unhappy. 
but the little friends of the absent Santa Claus labored faithfully and intelligently to carry out their master's ideas, and they made fewer errors than might be expected under such unusual circumstances. And although they worked as swiftly as possible, day had begun to break before the toys and other presents were all distributed. So for the first time in many years, the reindeer trotted into the Laughing Valley on their return in broad daylight, with the brilliant sun peeping over the edge of the forest to prove they were far behind their accustomed hours. Having put the deer in the stable, the little folk began to wonder how they might rescue their master, and they realized they must discover, first of all, what had happened to him and where he was. So Whisk the Fairy transported himself to the bower of the Fairy Queen, which was located deep in the heart of the forest of Bursey, and once there, it did not take him long to find out all about the naughty demons and how they had kidnapped the good Santa Claus to prevent his making children happy. The Fairy Queen also promised her assistance, and then, fortified by this powerful support, Whisk flew back to where Nutter and Peter and Kilter awaited him, and the four counseled together and laid plans to rescue their master from his enemies. It is possible that Santa Claus was not as merry as usual during the night that succeeded his capture, for although he had faith in the judgment of his little friends, he could not avoid a certain amount of worry, and an anxious look would creep at times into his kind old eyes, as he thought of the disappointment that might await his dear little children. And the demons who guarded him by turns, one after another, did not neglect to taunt him with contemptuous words in his helpless condition. When Christmas Day dawned, the demon of malice was guarding the prisoner, and his tongue was sharper than any of the others. The children are waking up, Santa, he cried. They are waking up to find their stockings empty. Ho, ho! How they will quarrel and wail and stamp their feet in anger. Our caves will be full today, old Santa. Our caves are sure to be full. But to this, as to other like taunts, Santa Claus answered nothing. He was much grieved by his capture, it is true, but his courage did not forsake him, and finding that the prisoner would not reply to his jeers, the demon of malice presently went away and sent the demon of repentance to take his place. This last personage was not so disagreeable as the others. He had gentle and refined features, and his voice was soft and pleasant in tone. My brother demons do not trust me overmuch, said he as he entered the cavern. But it is morning now, and the mischief is done. You cannot visit the children again for another year. That is true, answered Santa Claus almost cheerfully. Christmas Eve is past, and for the first time in centuries I have not visited my children. The little ones will be greatly disappointed, murmured the demon of repentance almost regretfully, but that cannot be helped now. Their grief is likely to make the children selfish and envious and hateful, and if they come to the cave of the demons today, I shall get a chance to lead some of them to my cave of repentance. Do you never repent yourself? asked Santa Claus curiously. Oh, yes, indeed, answered the demon. I am even now repenting that I assisted in your capture. Of course, it is too late to remedy the evil that has been done, but repentance, you know, can only come after an evil thought or deed, for in the beginning there is nothing to repent of. So I understand, said Santa Claus. Those who avoid evil need never visit your cave. As a rule, that is true, replied the demon. Yet you, who have done no evil, are about to visit my cave at once, for to prove that I sincerely regret my share in your capture, I am going to permit you to escape. This speech greatly surprised the prisoner, until he reflected that it was just what might be expected of the demon of repentance. The fellow at once busied himself untying the knots that bound Santa Claus and unlocking the chains that fastened him to the wall. Then he led the way through a long tunnel until they both emerged in the cave of repentance. I hope you will forgive me, said the demon pleadingly. I am not really a bad person, you know, and I believe I accomplish a great deal of good in the world. With this, he opened a back door that led in a flood of sunshine, and Santa Claus sniffed the fresh air gratefully. I bear no malice, said he to the demon in a gentle voice, and I am sure the world would be a dreary place without you. So good morning, and a Merry Christmas to you. With these words, he stepped out to greet the bright morning, 
and a moment later he was trudging along, whistling softly to himself, on his way to his home in the Laughing Valley. Marching over the snow toward the mountain was a vast army, made of the most curious creatures imaginable. There were numberless nooks from the forest, as rough and crooked in appearance as the gnarled branches of the trees they ministered to, and there were dainty rills from the fields, each one bearing the emblem of the flower or plant it guarded. Behind these were many ranks of pixies, gnomes, and nymphs, and in the rear a thousand beautiful fairies floated along in gorgeous array. This wonderful army was led by Whisk, Peter, Nutter, and Kilter, who had assembled it to rescue Santa Claus from captivity and to punish the demons who had dared to take him away from his beloved children. And although they looked so bright and peaceful, the little immortals were armed with powers that would be very terrible to those who had incurred their anger. Woe to the demons of the caves if this mighty army of vengeance ever met them. But lo, coming to meet his loyal friends appeared the imposing form of Santa Claus, his white beard floating in the breeze and his bright eyes sparkling with pleasure at this proof of the love and veneration he had inspired in the hearts of the most powerful creatures in existence. And while they clustered around him and danced with glee at his safe return, he gave them earnest thanks for their support. But Whisk and Nutter and Peter and Kilter he embraced affectionately. It is useless to pursue the demons, said Santa Claus to the army. They have their place in the world and can never be destroyed. But that is a great pity, nevertheless, he continued musingly. So the fairies and nooks and pixies and rills all escorted the good man to his castle, and there left him to talk over the events of the night with his little assistants. Whisk had already rendered himself invisible and flown through the big world to see how the children were getting along on this bright Christmas morning, and by the time he returned, Peter had finished telling Santa Claus of how they had distributed the toys. We really did very well, cried the fairy in a pleased voice, for I found little unhappiness among the children this morning. Still, you must not get captured again, my dear master. For we might not be so fortunate another time in carrying out your ideas. He then related the mistakes that had been made, and which he had not discovered until his tour of inspection. And Santa Claus at once sent him with rubber boots for Charlie Smith, and a doll for Mamie Brown, so that even those two disappointed ones became happy. As for the wicked demons of the caves, they were filled with anger and chagrin. When they found that their clever capture of Santa Claus had come to naught. Indeed, no one on that Christmas day appeared to be at all selfish or envious or hateful. And realizing that while the children's saint had so many powerful friends, it was folly to oppose him, the demons never again attempted to interfere with his journeys on Christmas Eve. End of A Kidnapped Santa Claus. Recorded by Judy Bieber. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him on the day, the Son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean estate where rocks and ass are feeding? Good Christian fear for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. Nail spear shall pierce him through the cross, be born for me, for you. the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of kings salvation brings, let love